Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Set for touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Um, go ahead, have your notes out. We're going to be continuing with the Russian Civil War. I thought yesterday we might get into the Irish War of Independence. Aye, Ireland, that's going to be an interesting one. Um, but we didn't get to it, so probably that will be coming up for you guys on Wednesday next week. Okay? So, yeah, we're definitely going deep into... <coughs> The origins of World War II, all those things that were just like, <laughs> wow, death, destruction, fighting. And there's not too much like lovely, calm, cool things. So hope you guys enjoyed your, what was it, the 1920s unit you did in Mrs. Rao's class? Yeah. The Great Gatsby? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that's like the roaring 20s. Yeah, well, they were roaring and on fire in some other parts of the uh, world, particularly once we got to the 30s. Yikes. Yeah, speaking of which, um, let me see, by the time we get together next time, um, things will be in preparation in Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. It's going to be pretty quiet there, I hope, since, uh, let me see, the number has gone up now to 26,000 uh, United States military personnel, including among them 300 Idaho guardsmen. I think they're pretty much kind of like making sure that it's like we're not going to have uh, like last week repeated. So you know how it is sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I wasn't ready for this. Now I'm going to over-prepare. So over-prepare on the security. I think there's going to be a lot of security and so forth going on in state capitals, um, you know, in case, in case somebody was doing something silly and stupid there. Yes? Yeah, and I think, I mean, the... the yeah, dancing in retrospect, I mean, this happens when, when something bad happens. I mean, in your own life, you're like, wow, I did really bad on that test. Maybe, if I really think about it next time, I'll prepare more. I mean, so the example is Capitol uh, Hill Police and, Was and Washington, D.C. Uh, police and security and so forth. They looked and they're like, wow, we didn't really have enough people uh, on hand to prepare for what actually went down. They thought it was going to be like, you know, another large you just protest, but not trying to break into the building. A lot of those guys, I think like pretty much the top people in all of the, the House and the Senate, um, Sergeant at Arms and the Capitol Hill Police Chief, they all were resigned or quit. Um, and they're replaced with different people. And so now you've got a lot of U.S. involvement in the D.C. The District of Columbia is like tapping into National Guard resources and so forth. And so, I mean, they've got them all over the place. If you've seen the pictures, they're in the Capitol building. They're lying all over the place. They've got all kinds of perimeters set up. There's all kinds of just Airbnb is not, is like canceling all the reservations for people that were coming into Washington, D.C. I mean, it's like, whoa. I mean, and they're, they're giving money to, they're paying off the people who made the reservations as well as the people who had, um, you know, we're planning on getting the money from it. Let's just hope it's really boring, you know? I mean, so what's left? Let's see. Uh, I, uh, you know, two, o two oaths of office and one speech. Yeah, I mean, some of the other, like, stuff that happens normally at inauguration, like typically at inauguration the night before, um, the one who's going to be inaugurated, will show up at like three or four different inaugural balls as like big parties and stuff. You know, so that's like, you know, it's got like a whole big festive thing. And then the inauguration itself uh, is followed by a parade where you have um, the president and others and high school bands and all kinds of people going down Pennsylvania Avenue all the way to the, the White House. And then they get out and they, the, the president and so forth and their guests watch the rest of the parade go by. You know, and it's, you know, it's a festive kind of thing. In my 12th grade class, we're, right, we were showing a clip of, um, as part of their unit, let me see, the 1977, January 1977 inauguration of Jimmy Carter, where he kind of did something different. Instead of going in the car the whole way down, he walked, you know, which is probably kind of cool. Can you walk from one of those locations to the other without too much difficulty, capital to the White House? Sure, yeah, I mean, that's what happened last week. There were a lot of people near the White House that walked over to the Capitol building and then went inside. Um, and then, of course, like you probably heard me say, I was at the inauguration in 1981 when I was a high school student. Let me see, I was a senior. 
Yeah, for Reagan's first inauguration, which is really cool. I mean, it was um, festive and everything, and so I enjoyed that. But yeah, you guys will be here. You'll be in school. And I'm sure some of you guys will be checking and going, is there any news? In this situation, probably no news will be good news. Right? And then we can get back to the normal stuff of, oh, I agree with Biden's plans. Oh, I don't agree with Biden's plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, that's what we do. That's what we do in our country. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and the other thing is, um, and watch this one, because this will be, and maybe it'll be almost like an afterthought. It's like, what about Trump? Since we last got together, Trump got impeached for the second time. Okay, so that went through the House. All the Democrats voted for the impeachment. Ten Republicans did. So now it goes to the Senate. He's, Trump's already going to be out of office as of Wednesday of next week. So what is the, if you get two-thirds, which is doubtful because you'd need like 17 Republicans to uh, vote for the conviction, um, it would impact Trump's um, uh, like benefits and so forth as a uh, former president and also the ability to run for office again, which ironically, I wouldn't be surprised that the Democrats would be like, Sure, Republicans, go ahead and nominate Trump to be your vice pre to be your presidential nominee in 2024. Let's see how that goes in the general election. I mean, the Democrats would be like, sure, fine. Which is why I think it's actually kind of an interesting uh, thing within the Republican Party as far as like, what do they do with it? I mean, it's an interesting transition. As of 12 o'clock noon. Washington, D.C. time, Wednesday of next week, Trump is no longer president. That's, you know. And the responsibilities for government and so forth, shh, Danton, are on the new president. And the vice president's got, you know, tie votes and so forth. I think people are going to be watching the vice president a lot more carefully, I suppose, over the next four years because of the unique situation of having uh, one of, if not the oldest presidents in our country's history as far as, you know, you know, at the time of the beginning of the four years. So there's a lot of focus on, like, is this uh, intentionally going to be a one-year term for, for Biden or not? Or, you know, I don't know. The last time we had, like, somebody who was really, really old, I think was Reagan. His second term, he was quite old. And by the end of his four-year term, people were like, is he showing signs of senility and so forth? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he did come down with Alzheimer's. And that ultimately was a big part that took his life. And, you know, why, if you know people that have had Alzheimer's and so forth, or those kind of issues, I mean, it, it was like he wasn't remembering all kinds of things in his final days. And there were, there were some signs, perhaps, in the uh, final uh, year or two in his second term. Okay. So, um, for you guys, yeah, you guys pretty clear on how things work next week? Question, Haley. Where are you going to be on Thursday, no, Friday, of next week at 11 o'clock? You're going to be leaving school, exactly, yeah. Because uh, you guys got that. One of the, some, of, some of the classes are like, nobody ever told us. So sometimes you guys get told. It's like that with older people. You get told things five times, and then on something else, there we go. You know. Anton, you were told. <laughs> it's a half day. It's a half day on Friday. Yeah, it's a half day. All right? Is that right, really? And I've told it multiple times. <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> so I think because I teach almost everybody in the high school, I uh, just got half of the ninth graders, they're, they've heard. So if you're still sticking around, you know. Are any of you guys taking the PSAT? Okay, here's the deal. Make sure that you get the heck out of the building after the PSAT is done on Tuesday because otherwise the buses don't run until the normal time and somebody, <coughs> your teachers, have to like sort of like be there present and uh, supervise. But there's going to be no, well then make arrangements. Okay, there we go. All right, let's do the pledge. Yeah, no, that'd be interesting, yeah. All right, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was interesting because I was thinking somebody, you were making the comment, um, you know, depending on what happens with Joe Biden and so forth, well, I think a lot of people are looking at Kamala Harris as, as the potential, I mean, she ran for president um, for the Democratic nomination, didn't get it, was one of their ones that stepped out, you know, fairly early on. And then, yeah, actually, it's weird because, like, in some of the early debates, you know who she went after? She went after the leader who was Biden. So she was like, yeah. Yeah, well, she basically was like, you know, you weren't really with us in the civil rights movement back in the 70s and stuff. And they're like, woo. Anyway, I think they made up enough after that, you know, because it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, and that's actually a good thing about politics. You know, you face off and then you find areas to work together. And within political parties, that happens a little bit more. Like George H.W. Bush, he was Reagan's vice president, and he ran against Reagan when they were first going for the nomination. In fact, he was the top contender. But Reagan ultimately got the nomination, and then when he looked for a vice presidential nominee, he went with that. Who are the Republicans going to get? This is interesting, because here's a weird scenario. I was thinking, hmm. Will the next presidential election result in the first woman president? Possible, right? I mean, the Democrats potentially could have uh, Kamala Harris as the, vice, as the, as the uh, presidential nominee, in which case she would tick off several ones. First woman president, first African-American president, first one with Indian heritage. And when I mean Indian, I'm not talking about Native American. I'm talking about Asia. If the Republicans, one of the potential contenders is former South Carolina governor, former United Nations ambassador for Trump, um, Nikki Haley, who would be first woman president and also first Indian, because she has uh, Indian heritage as well, also Indian as in Asia, right? Because, of course, Columbus, you know, when he arrived, he's like, this is Indian. Anyway, he was off a continent, you know. There was one more ocean to cross, but that's okay. You know, he didn't have uh, very good reception on his, uh, like, GPS locator. Yeah. A page, yep. Oh, I did. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good job. I got paid. Um, the ones that do it during the school year, they get paid, and they actually went to, like, page school, which is kind of cool, because then they would, like, work during the day, and then they'd have work at night. Summer page was much better because you show up, you do your work, you do your deliveries and so forth, you get paid. Um, and I had it real nice because I was like using uh, public transportation, the metro, and I stayed at home. There were others that came from different parts of the country that did a thing and they like rented apartments and so forth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, you get your, you guys know this, you get your income taxes back, but like your uh, payroll taxes for uh, Medicaid. Medicare, Social Security, so forth, you don't get those back. I mean, those, those just go. Okay, you ready to dive into uh, Crazy War? Back, back, uh, back into this one? Yeah, let's kind of check and see. I've got on my notes here that you guys don't have anything really in detail about the whites. No. All right. But do you have, like, how they kind of break down? The different, the reds are easy, right? Garen? The reds are easy. Yeah, the whites are like a whole multitude of things. Obviously, we haven't got quite to that. But the reds, just to recap on the reds, uh, did the reds win mostly or not? They mostly won, okay? And I think the reds did not win in Finland because that was part of Russia and it gained its independence. The Reds did not win in retaking Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania that ha had been part of Russia. They got their independence. Make sure you have that down. The Reds did not recapture Poland. Okay? Now, it's weird because the leader of the Reds, Lenin, signed a treaty with Germany to end World War I. What was the name of that treaty? Brest-Litovsk. Yeah, end World War I as far as Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Ottoman Empire, and Russia are concerned. And so they were like, okay, Germany, you can have that. But Germany lost the war, too. So Russia's like, well, if, if you lost, then we're going to try and take it back. So the Reds, make sure you have that. They tried to retake Poland, and they will fail. Okay? So that kind of orangish area, 
That's why I like this particular map, because it shows you areas that had been part of Russia. And so Poland was able to come out of it. Poland looks at the end of World War I and goes, this is good. This is the first time we're going to be a country again. Right? They got uh, German territory back, Austrian territory back, and a big chunk of Russian territory, and they crafted Poland. One that tried to gain independence, make sure you have this down, because we're going to be talking about this area right here. It's right near Poland, just north of the Black Sea. Ukraine. Yeah, Ukraine. Okay? They will try to gain independence, but they ultimately will fail. The Reds will prevail and capture and control Ukraine. Okay? So the Reds had it better because they had a coordinated uh, leadership. Danton, who was the, who's giving most of the credit for leading the military effort on behalf of the Reds of these three? Trotsky. Very good. Trotsky is the war commissar. Very good. Okay? The Whites now. Let's get to the Whites. Uh, oh, by the way, the Reds, did they want democracy? No. no. Yeah, they're like, democracy's stupid. That's not how you're going to get to the perfect society where everyone works equally for the benefit of all people. How you get to that is you get into a violent revolution in order to defeat the capitalist and their little crony democratic, liberal democratic types and so forth. You have to crush them, and then you can have a wonderful time. Okay? Yeah, so, I mean... Anyway, so yeah, I mean, there's going to be plenty of people in the 20th century that will go, democracy sucks. It's no way to get to what you really, really want in the world. Which, yeah, I mean, if you look at democracy, you're like, <laughs> people are looking over the United States and going, oh, your democracy's not working very well. These so, hey, America, let's get democracy working again. Yeah? Let's have elections. Let's have really good arguments. Let's prepare for continual really good arguments based on principle and so forth. Okay? And uh, respect for the uh, methods that we actually um, have as part of that system. All right. So the whites. Let's make sure we identify the whites and the people who are against the reds. All right? So these are people who are against the reds. Here's one, and you can't really call them the whites, but they help the whites. We identified them earlier. Foreign armies. Right? We got, I think we got those in there because we got the Czechoslovaks. We talked about that crazy thing. Uh, I can't get through that door. <laughs> All right. I'll go through near <laughs> Japan. <laughs> I mean, like, I'll head to the Pacific Ocean. I think there's a boat there that will take me the long way to where I want to go. We got the foreign armies, right? Aiden, did the United States send in uh, uh, troops? Did they stay there very long? No. No. Did the British and the French? Uh, no. They actually, they sent in a little bit. Yeah, and I wanted to clarify that with you guys. The French and the British sent in a little bit. And it's really one of these things that's kind of like, because if the British and the French and the United States are trying to overturn what's going on in Russia, does Russia have an argument that the communists, the winners, the reds, do they have an argument that we butt into their business? Yeah. 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 Now, we could try and <laughs> make a weak counter argument that, well, we didn't try very hard. Yeah. Put this down. The communists in Russia are going to remind us of that over and over and over again. They're going to say, you tried to mess with our internal domestic political situation. You sent your armies in there. And they'll use that as a justification for, I don't know, building a massive nuclear weapons uh, arsenal. Because what is that going to do in the Cold War? prevent us from trying to do that again, pal. And of course, we're like, hey, you're being threatening to us. And the Soviets will go, hmm, I'm trying to think of the last time that the Russians actually invaded the United States. Uh, never. You know? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see a fantastical uh, movie trailer uh, that I show um, students in the 12th. Red Dawn, have you ever seen Red Dawn? Yes. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's like this, it's like this, it's like this imagined invasion of Soviet Russians and Cubans and Sandinista Nicaraguans, and they land in the middle of America to take it over. America's like, what? And the, uh, and the heroes of that movie are teenagers. Yeah, they're just like you. Yeah, they go up into the mountains and they fight guerrilla warfare. Woo! It's, it's such a 1980s movie. Anyway, but yeah. So who are, the, who are the whites? All right, write this down. Okay, the whites were just a whole mixture of different groups that had different um, goals, and they were not very well coordinated. 
Okay? So, in a sense, you can look in this, in this map, and this, is, this shows you one point in time. And I'll show you a kind of a, a stream of like how the war goes, and it's like, whoa, that's a mess. But this shows you kind of one point in time. It looks like maybe the whites could have the reds surrounded. And maybe they could prevail if they had enough support from, you know, America, Britain, France, and so forth, perhaps. But maybe if they just organized it better themselves. But they won't. There's going to be different motivations, all right? Let's go through the different groups. Among the whites, some of them are monarchists, okay? Some of them are monarchists, which means... No, I mean, well, they want to restore the monarchy. They want to make Russia great the old way again. They want to restore the czar. You got that? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the czar quit, and they're like, well, but we, we, we've had a czar for a long, long time, and we understand why he quit, because uh, World War I was going really badly, but, you know, that's gone. <laughs> Let's bring in another czar. Actually, they do have to bring in another czar, because who had... Who had, who had uh, <clears throat> who had control of the previous czar? Rasputin. Rasputin's dead. He's Aww. dead. He, by the time this is all going on, he's already dead. Wow. The Romanov family... Oh, give me a break. The Romanov family had already... Uh, like per certain members of the Romanov family had already poisoned him. Yeah, that didn't kill him. And they already shot him. Yeah, that didn't kill him. And they already drowned him. That did it. Okay? It doesn't always work. <laughs> I don't know. You know, they were like, well, he's still moving. I don't know. There's a river. It's cold. It's winter. Dump him. And that did the job. So, no. Uh, the czar, put this down. I mean, you can, it, it's actually kind of a sad thing. And the British royal family that was related to the Russian royal family felt really bad afterwards. Because there was some question of, like, when the czar quit, get him out of the country, exile him to, to Britain. We'll be safer there. But the British are like, oh, I don't know, is that a good idea? And it never really came together. And then eventually, when the October Revolution of 1917 took place, they were, they were under the custody of the Reds. So they were under the custody of the Reds. He had not gotten into, like, white-controlled territory. So Lenin's trying to decide what to do. And in one sense, you're like, let me see, how much of a threat is the czar? He doesn't want the job back. His wife, his four daughters, his son, they, 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 they don't want to do anything. And yet, you've got it in your notes, are there people fighting against the Reds to try and bring back the czar? Yeah, so what does Lenin decide to do with Nicholas II? Remove him as a potential motivation for these monarchists. That's, I mean, that's the main reason why they murdered the entire family. You got that? Yeah, I mean, it sucks for them. And they were buried in a shallow grave in the area there that they had been killed. All of them, including Anastasia. We know that. I mean, there was some question as, well, did Anastasia escape? Because somebody popped up and goes, I'm Anastasia. Right. She wasn't. I think she was from Virginia. One of the Anastasia wannabes was like a woman that grew up in Virginia. Like, well, anyway, whatever. It's like, yeah, it's like, how did that come through? But I mean, here's the deal. If the monarchists are like, oh my gosh, now Nicholas is dead, who do we fight? There's cousins. Hello. I mean, good grief. In a royal family, there's always somebody, and plenty of the other royal family-ish types had escaped. Is there someone today alive who is the heir to Slytherin, excuse me, the heir to the Romanov dynasty? Yeah, and they're living in Spain. They're, no, not Natasha Romanov. No, that's pretty, pretty good. The Black Widow. Yeah. Um, no, there is, they're living in Spain. I mean, their family had been exiled there for a long, long time. And here's the deal. When the communists uh, were over, uh, overdone in uh, 1991, some of the Russians are like, well, we got rid of the communists. Maybe we should do like a constitutional monarchy like they have in Britain and have like a Romanov, because that'd be pretty cool. I mean, they dug up the, the bones of the last Romanov rulers and put them in, and reconsecrated them, and put them in with the bones of all the other czars. So, I mean, that's cool. So they invited this guy, who was, I want to say, like a teenager at the time, and his mom, and they came to visit Russia. And the Russians are like, well, I don't know, maybe we should or shouldn't. They weren't impressed. They didn't show enough respect for one of the main cultural institutions in Russia, which is the Russian Orthodox Church. They visited a Russian Orthodox Church, but she had this, like, really boofy hairdo thing, and she didn't want to cover it, which she should have. 
which is like to be a sign of kind of disrespectful. And the teen, it just didn't go over. So they were like, eh, whatever. You know? And so I don't even hear them talking about that. Putin, does he want to have some Romanov like having something? No. no. So that's the monarchists. All right? so, so some of the whites... Some of the whites wanted to restore the monarchy. All right, here's another group. Call them like the liberal Democrats, or you can call them the liberals. Don't think of it as like liberal as in like, you know, more government involvement and so forth. When you hear liberal democracy and so forth, just think in favor of democracy. Okay? I mean, that's the basic thing. All right? So some of them wanted uh, uh, to defeat the Reds and put in democracy, right? You know, let's get this thing going again, like Kerensky had tried to do you know, in the 1917. And so that was one of the motivations. There's a smaller group that's going to be the far right. You call them reactionaries. And we'll get to know the far right very well in this 20th century. Yeah. Raise your hand if you can tell me what would be some examples of far right political parties. Hitler. Nazis, fascists. Yeah, Hitler obviously is the leader of the Nazis. Yeah, we'll get to know those guys very well. Okay, are they in favor of democracy? No. Do they like communism? No! Right? They don't want the government in charge of everything. They still want private business. But, um, yeah, they want... <laughs> Actually, they still do call for a lot of government in the yeah. sense that <laughs> they, they don't like free speech and things like that. Anyway, so that's, let me see, that's three different groups. Yay. Lack of coordination and so forth. All right. Now, let me identify... No, three. Yeah. Doom, two... Yeah, that, what a mess. Uh, let me just identify. Actually, if you look at the bottom of uh, page one, you'll see. Sorry, folks. You know my test. At the end of this unit, I'm going to have a lovely test for you. It'll be worth 70 points, and there'll be all kinds of lovely names on there. And I'm not very nice about that, am I? If I put a matching section together of names, am I going to make put just one Russian name and mix it up with others, like Chinese and German and French? No, I'm going to grow a group of five. The five Russian names. So here are your Russian names. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I mean, some of them you're like, which are the Russian names you know best? And you're like, okay, who is the leader of the communists? Lenin. Yeah, Vladimir Lenin. Who became the leader of the communists after Lenin died? Stalin. Okay, you got that. Who was the, leader, the first leader of the southern uh, a group of white armies in, in, in the Russian Civil War? Write it down. Anton Denikin. In the South, in the early stages of the war. Anton Denikin. It's, it's third bullet point from the bottom on page one. Anton Denikin. So here's what you need to know about Anton Denikin. Okay? And I'm not going to get so refined as to, was he more of a monarchist or was he more of a did? He was among the disunified white armies fighting in the South. And when I mean the South, I mean like kind of in the Ukrainian region and in the Caucasus. His army initially is, not going, is ultimately going to be unsuccessful. So you can write that down, unsuccessful. Most of these ones are going to be unsuccessful. So that's something you want to write. Okay, so in the Ukrainian region, fighting against the Reds, ultimately unsuccessful. Later, uh, you'll see in that same southern region, you'll see another army, and this one is going to be led by Petro Rangel. You see his name there? Petro Rangel. Another white, uh, white uh, armies in the south, so fighting in the Ukrainian region. What do you think? Successful ultimately or unsuccessful? Unsuccessful. You can write that down. Unsuccessful. And we'll play it out because I've got a couple of other colors I need to introduce in here. You're like, really? Did I already warn you, besides the reds and the whites, there's the uh, greens and the blacks? Yeah. Oh. I did warn you. Okay. All right. So we're going to get those guys, too. All right. So Petro Rangel ultimately <laughs> failed. All right. Now, over in the east, now by east, I mean like all, all the way to the Pacific, this is going to be a wide-ranging area, and they're going to keep this fight going on for quite some time. Alexander Kolchak is going to be the leader of the white armies in the east. Kolchak. Will he ultimately prevail? Well, you're like, let me see. That's still in Russia, and we see the Reds won in Russia, so no. He will not ultimately prevail. You're like, well, couldn't they have coordinated? But they could have. Maybe that would have made a difference. 
maybe if there had been more support and commitment uh, by the, uh, the allies, but they were tired of fighting. So how about this one? Nikolai Udanich, and he's going to be in the west-northwest, and he is going to ultimately have some success. And this map actually shows you the areas of his success. Take a look up here in the map here. He will be fighting Red Armies that are trying to retake Poland and the Baltic regions. And so Udanich, along with support from Poles and Estonians and so forth, will be able to defeat the Reds. Where? Here. Will Udanich be able to uh, overthrow? I said Udanich, right? Will he be able to overthrow the Russians west of these regions? No, he's not going to be able to overthrow them in Russia. So he has some success. Got that? Okay. Ukraine. Let's talk about the Greens. The Greens. You're like, what the heck? The Greens? Yeah, the Greens. The Greens are going to be fighting in Ukraine for national independence. Okay. And they're going to be fighting mostly in the initial stages. They're going to be fighting the whites. And they're going to lose fairly early on. The Greens. So they're like, hey, could we have independence and so forth? And the whites are like, no, we're going to keep uh, all of Russia together. All right, so they're out of it. The next group is more interesting, perhaps, because there's going to be some nuance. The blacks. This is going to be in the latter stages of the Russian Civil War. The blacks. Make sure you put this down as well. They are also located fighting in Ukraine. And they're also nationalists. They're trying to fight for Ukrainian independence. So we got two armies that had uh, gotten sized up, and they're fighting for independence. And the blacks, there's an interesting group. In their group, they are, they're led by Nestor Makhno. Okay, so we got a name for uh, the leader of the blacks. Uh, they're an interesting group. A lot of Jews in Ukraine, and they are, uh, many of them are supporting this. And as far as their political ideology... Oh, let's go ahead and get, identify it. Anarchists. Do you have any idea what an anarchist, what kind of government they like? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to see. Anarchists are really interesting. They start popping up in the late 1800s. One of them shot and killed uh, President McKinley, number 25. Why? Because he's the President of the United States. He's like the government. Shot and killed him, and, and that really changed American history, right? Because who was his vice president? <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Um, anarchists, I want to say anarchists also killed Tsar Nicholas, excuse me, Tsar Alexander II. You got to watch out for anarchists because they'll, like, they'll blow you up. They don't like government. It's really weird. Later, here's just like a little bit of a hint. Later, um, you know, like where do they fit? Are they, do, they, do they ally with like the fascists and the hard right wing? Or do they ally with, like, the far left wing? Or do they ally with, like, you know, democracy? I mean, where do you... You make some really strange allies in certain fights. Like, who was one of our most critical allies in World War II? We haven't covered it yet, but I think you know. I mean, you're like, well, Britain, <laughs> sort of. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with... But, I mean, who's really going to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hitler during World War II? Hitler is our opponent. Who is going to be our, one of our number one allies during World War II, fighting the Germans? It's going to be the Soviet Union, yeah. Yeah, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, at least right now, until we beat my enemy, and then we can be new more enemies. Yeah, Cold War. So when we get to the Spanish Civil War, we're going to have elected government, and then they're going to be like an attempt to overthrow them by the military, and then the anarchists are going to go, hmm, which side? They're going to support the government. And then the government has to make a decision. Do we give guns to the anarchists to fight off the military? And they're like, sure, we'll do that. Sure. Blacks. The blacks. Okay, Nestor Macno. And they actually make a smart decision because they're fighting against the whites. All right, so they're going to be fighting. I think that at that time they're going to be fighting mostly against armies led by Wrangell. Okay? They make an alliance. Who do you think they make an alliance with in order to fight the whites 
in the Ukrainian region. The blacks make an alliance with another group to fight against the whites. The greens are already gone. <laughs> Don't bring any more. They make an alliance with the reds. Write it down. They make an alliance with the reds. The blacks and the reds are fighting against the whites in Ukraine in the latter stages of the Civil War. And they win. <laughs> they win. All right, okay, you ready? Are you ready for the Star Wars analogy? Some of you guys are going to go, Whoosh. Others are going to go, <laughs> Order 66. All right? Some of you guys get that. Order 66, right? So you like Order 66. So for those of you guys who are into Star Wars, right, there was this war going on, and the Jedi uh, were allies with the clone army, and they were all fighting against, I forget, it was like some trade federation or some stupid thing like that. Anyway, they are, they're beating the trade federation, then all of a sudden, the Emperor sends Order 66, and the clones turn against the Jedi. Write it down. The Reds turn against the Blacks. And that was a real, that's not a conspiracy of stab in the back. That is a real stab in the back. Yeah. And how did the blacks do when fighting against the reds? They get beat. Yeah, they get beat. Do, and does Ukraine get their independence? No. No. Will they ever? No. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're a free country. All of it is free, except for the parts that uh, Putin took back, Crimea, and some parts in southeast Remember that part? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Although we don't recognize it. <laughs> yeah, shame on you. Putin, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, we're going to make it. Um, I think we've covered actually everything pretty well. One thing I do want, we got the Reds winning com complete control over Russia. So that'll be the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Soviet Union. Make sure you put this down in there. Because sometimes when the war is over, you're like, oh, gosh, the war is over. I finally feel safe. Maybe you really didn't want the Reds in charge, and maybe now you should fear for your life. Uh, Put this down. You know this because I told you about, I mean, Lenin, is, he's got two more years at the end of the Civil War to be the leader before he dies, and then Stalin comes in. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Is Stalin afraid of potential enemies in his own country? Yes. He's going to kill, you had like, what, 21 million people? Some of them killed directly, some of them killed through starvation, some of them killed by packing them up and sending them to gulags. Put this down. This is the, the dangerous aftermath in the Civil War. If you're on the losing side, they're still coming around rounding up people who aren't really with us. And, of course, the irony is, you know, Stalin, who does he really, really have like a, 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 like a I don't really trust you and you should die? Trotsky, Trotsky and other leading Bolsheviks, other leading communists that help the communists to win the revolution and the civil war. He's like, I don't trust you anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the second thing. Hello, United States of America, do not have a civil war because it's not going to be like the easy civil war that we had, you know, north versus south. You know, if you were in the border regions, there was some like, you know, dangerous neighborhoods and sort and so forth. Right? But I mean, in America, if we ever did a civil war, it would be, be like Spain and, and Russia. You would have people on opposite sides in every neighborhood. It would be a mess. You don't want to go there. You do not want to go there. Because if one side wins, one, what do they do? They're fearful that the other side might come back. So they crush any potential opposition. You looked at me funny. You must be a potential opponent. I think you're a counter revolutionary. That's what, that's what Stalin would call anybody who doesn't agree with. And if you don't admit and confess to being a counter-revolutionary, they'll hold it under your family. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. It's messed up. All right. I want you to see how it played out visually. Okay? Uh, let me check this. I'm going to put it on uh, two times speed. This gives you a little bit of a sense of, I don't need any like, sound here, a little bit of a sense of how it played out. And with the, uh, the reservation that I'm not really sure how accurate these lines are that this uh, person is using because, I mean, if we don't even know exactly, give or take, like, what, three or four million people, you know, how many people died? Well, how do we know exactly what the lines were? Here's November 1917. You see the Bolshevik Revolution taking place. Just to give you a sense, look at the map. 
This area right up here is St. Petersburg, okay? This area right here is Moscow, okay? This, like, d -d 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 -d, that's the Trans-Siberian Railway, right? And that's going to be fought over very heavily, and that's going to be the lifeline, ultimately, to get the Czechoslovak uh, troops over here and out of the country. Yeah, so right at this point, you still have, uh, you know, the Russian uh, fighting against um, Germany and so forth, all right? And then, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution takes place. And the Bolsheviks are having some success there early on, consolidating right in here. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're kind of lumping here quite a bit. And so when is the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and the war is over? March 1918. Okay? Yeah. Oh, now, let's pause for here for a moment. Blue. Now, this is kind of, it's tough because you got sort of blue, which is the white movement, and then blue is the allied powers. Right up here is foreigners coming in. Which foreign group is going to be sending troops up here? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Right up here, the United States sends troops, okay? Um, and they're not going to stay there for that long. Yeah, so the Reds, this is kind of their core area right here, and there's a lot of people, a lot of very important cities right in here. So, I mean, there was a time where it looked like, wow, the Reds are on the ropes if the Whites could really consolidate things, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is like after World War I is over. It's 1919, but... Yeah, oh, yeah, and I mentioned to you Japan. We got that already. Japan is going to keep their troops pretty much over here to kind of like make sure that their interests are taken care of. I mean, look, the Whites are doing pretty well. I mean, they're pushing back. And yet... Ultimately, they're not going to be able to be as successful. Is that PSAT stuff? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to put some back here. Did you do the practice stuff? Okay, so if anyone's taking the PSAT, grab one of those on the way back. Oh, sorry, you blinked. Uh, the greens popped up, and now they're crushed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, yeah, they're the greens, except they're purple. Yeah. Sorry. Now they're gone. But there will be a, a reemergence of Ukrainian nationalists, the blacks. And these, are, these, these guys are also red, too. So, I mean, Soviet partisans, yeah, whatever. They're like pro-Soviet. And they're ultimately going to be like, yeah, we'll be part of your country. Okay? Is there going to be a revival? Is there going to be one more surge? No, I think this is starting to kind of like not work out very well. Oh, wait, wait. Nope. Is there some fighting in here? Almost. We still got two more years in this war. Oh, wait! Look, here come the blacks! Yeah. And this is why I'm looking at this going, huh? I don't know how accurate this is, but this represents the height of the black power. Not 1960s black power, but black power within the context of the <laughs> Civil War. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, anyway. Yeah. And so... Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes that way. Let's jump ahead. Yeah, but, I mean, what's over here? Polar bears? You know, polar bears are cool in some kind of fantastical science fiction-y kind of fights, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And there it is. Yeah, Putin on a bear. And then the three-minute history, which is actually four minutes. We'll start this. separating and fighting the Bolsheviks, notably Finland, Ukraine, Poland, the Cossacks, the Caucasian states, and the Baltic states. However, when the Bolsheviks made peace with Germany in March 1918, many of these nations were left under German influence. Thus, many would go on to fight civil wars and wars against other new states. Meanwhile, the Russian people rose up against the Bolsheviks, opposing left-wing groups as some of the first to fight, while monarchists, republicans, foreign volunteers, and various other anti-Bolsheviks made alliances with the regionalists and formed the White Movement. In early 1918, the Whites under Alexander Kolchak established their government in the East, but the first major battles took place in the Northern Caucasus, where the Whites had a great deal of support from the Cossacks. Otherwise, peasants defending their villages formed Green Armies and anarchist formed yeah. Black Armies. But in May 1918, the Bolsheviks prevented the Czechoslovak Legion from traveling to fight their Austrian enemies on the front again. So they revolted and took key cities along the Trans-Siberian Railway. So, fearing that the Tsar could be rescued, the Bolsheviks had him executed in July. 
To make matters worse for the Bolsheviks, the Allied powers who hoped to overthrow them and reopen the Eastern Front began sending troops to Russia. They moved into Arkhangelsk, Central Asia, the Cold They should have used a different color than red. So after peace with Germany, Allied invasions, and the White Army's advances, by late 1918, the Bolsheviks... Well, we still got three more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Although they did have some problems all over. I think I might finish this one out next time. Yeah. Yeah, because there's actually, it's like for a three-minute one. And, I mean, if you were to just watch that before I did all the notes, you go, that's confusing. I mean, it's still confusing. It is. So we'll recap that, uh, and then uh, we'll do the Irish War of Independence next time. So after you've wiped it down, au revoir. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. See you. Thank you. Okay. Good thing I've got a plug there, huh? Yeah. No, I mean, that works. I think that was a wise... See.